create a more modern and robust democracy for all Nebraskans. I also particularly, and I want you guys to stand, Sarah's already standing, but there's a few other, Alex and then Steve, if you guys could stand, they, they are the ones that put this together, coordinated it, make sure that it's moved. Working an amazing security board. Um, also, if all the Civic Nebraska staff could stand to be recognized real quick, these are the folks that have worked for us today in our community. Also, I know that we have a few board members in here. I'm afraid to say names because I might miss them, but if our board members could please stand. I know there's a few of you, so you better stand. There we go, Rita. There are a few others back there. I think I'll here. Probably miss some of you. I talk to them, but I'll go high. also a board member. Um, so, yeah, there he is. <laughs> so, in any case, this would not be possible without all of them, and it would not be possible without all of you. And so I just want to thank all of our sponsors as well. They're on the back of your program. Many of our sponsors have been with us for many, many years. And so you know who you are. They're on the back of the program. Thank you so much. So in 2008, the first seeds of what would become Civic Nebraska were planted on the 10th floor of Harbor Hall. And I was in the room when it happened, when a group of politically diverse undergraduates formed Nebraskans for Civic Reform with the goal of creating a more modern, robust democracy for all Nebraskans. And we emphasize the all. Since then, we've not only moved out of my dorm room, a joke that never gets old for me, if you've been to a VLEs, but we've also grown to a full and part-time staff of over 80. We've spread across the state, from our headquarters in Lincoln, to the Tri-Cities area, to the Panhandle, and all points in between, and even Scott's Bluff. I think Daniel's here somewhere. There he is, right in front of me. So in any case, we're proud that we've grown so many successful initiatives across the state of Nebraska. And at Civic Nebraska, we often describe our democracy as a garden. A successful garden performs well according to the unending cycles of nature, of course, but it also requires regular tending, setting of goals, and an understanding of connected ecosystems to flourish. That sounds a lot like a democracy. A garden requires individual effort and contribution to succeed, but also cooperation and collaboration to serve as many people as possible. And so does a democracy. We tend our state's garden of democracy in three major ways. First, we build young civic leaders. Our youth civic leadership programs have served hundreds of students a day in after school programs, after school clubs, and during the, during the day programs in partnership with teachers. These efforts persisted amid the pandemic and provided critical resources and support for our students, parents, and communities. And I wanna thank all of our staff that worked in those programs under really, really challenging conditions for the last two years. So you can give them a round of applause. Why did we do this? Because young Nebraskans who think critically about and make the meaning of societal issues are better able to navigate their individual environments and succeed in them. Our work empowers them to engage creatively with the world around them. And there's a fire truck right outside. I hope that's not for anybody. Our work also works to make sure, that, I hope nobody pulled along. <laughs> and then also find ways to improve it. Second, we strengthen civic life in our state. Democracy works best when we have the will and the ability to tackle mutual problems together. Through our civic health work, Civic Nebraska helps Nebraskans and communities of all sizes do just that. Our civic health initiatives, including Collective Impact Lincoln, Capital Experience Days, the Nebraska Unify Challenge, Civic Saturdays, and many, many others, strengthen Civic Nebraska's civic, or excuse me, the state's civic fabric. Our urban and rural initiatives connect Nebraskans to advocacy, training, and resources so they can take on meaningful, positive change in their communities. And finally, we protect every Nebraskan's right to vote. A year-round culture of civic engagement in our state deserves and requires elections that are nonpartisan, accessible, and modern. And that is more important than ever now. Our voting rights, advocacy, election protection, research, and community engagement are key to keeping barriers to the ballot minimal in Nebraska. 
If you or your family member or friends ever have a question about voting, I hope you'll go to civicnebraska.org and click on voting rights where you can have almost all of your answers, all of your questions answered. And if you can't, give us a call and we'll answer them for you. So to say that much has changed since 2019, I think is an understatement. There has been an astonishing shift in the way that we work, communicate, and interact, and how we engage with each other in our communities. And I think while it'd be easy to dwell on the challenges, let's focus on the opportunities because there are many of them. The pandemic provided us a clear opening to explore the necessary inner work that many of us have set aside in the pre-COVID years. In fact, this year's staff, our staff, has been working closely with our board chair, Prina Bonsall, to explore this inner work, to find the kind of deeply innovative, co-creative, participatory processes and values that we hope to ignite in our own state. We will take these skills and approaches and bring them into our outer work so that we can help communities ignite their own inner power. And because strong communities do not build themselves, they simply cannot rise up simply by massive infrastructure projects or spectacular buildings. They are created most enduringly in their people, people who desire to bring positive, meaningful change to their chat towns and communities and cities, and who have an inclusive and just vision for the future. This is why we do the work that we do. This is why we are honoring the people that we're honoring here tonight. We empower Nebraskans to take action we show them how to become leaders or strengthen their current leadership skills and imagine new ways of expanding our democracy and achieving their community's desires and dreams. Strengthening our democracy. And that is why each and every year we honor fellow Nebraskans, many of which you will hear from soon. And that's why we have the Strengthening Democracy Awards, to honor outstanding Nebraskans whose day-to-day -day actions create more powerful citizens and residents in our community. No act is too small, no voice is too young, no issue is too narrow. In a democracy, small acts compound until eventually they reach a tipping point. That's why the way forward to a stronger, more modern, and more robust democracy is what we work to achieve every single day. Tonight's winners are educators and students, advocates of all kinds. We congratulate our honorees, knowing that for each deserving Nebraskan who comes on the stage, there are countless others who are tirelessly tending to our garden of democracy. That includes many of you in attendance tonight. While most of you won't be going home with an award, many are worthy of a round of applause for your engagement. So let's all give you a, a round of applause. And in the legislature, I learned that anything over five minutes is usually too much in terms of the speech. So without further ado, let's get this party started. I'm happy to welcome Steve Smith to the stage. Steve is Civic Nebraska's Director of Communications, and so that means he's good at speaking. And that also means he'll be emceeing the rest of our program, thank you. So thank you so much. My name is Steve Smith, and I'm the Director of Communications. And so I have the privilege of telling the world about how, what, and why we do. And it's a, really a, a dream job for me as a communicator to be able to talk about the people, a lot of the people in this room and the impact that we have. One of my favorite roles is to be a civic seminarian for Civic Saturday, which is uh, a gathering that we hold several times a year, usually quarterly. There's one coming up, actually, at the end of this month. And we do them because in a, there's a time of great anxiety that we feel, a disconnectedness that we feel, and political polarization. We need a place to come together in, in a civic community, in a civic community. And we need to reflect on and rededicate ourselves to that founding creed that those men in 1776 came up with for us all, right? It started in Seattle seven years ago, and it spread to about 100 different cities around the country, Civic Saturday, including here in Lincoln, what we call our 10th one uh, at the end of this month. 
The reason I bring this up is because we always need a poet for it. And I always enjoy having an original work of poetry. And so that means I call Matt Mason a lot with the Nebraska Writers Collective. They've just been an invaluable partner in what we do with, uh, with that event. And so as, as Sarah and I were talking about, what can we really do to, to get people to, to think about uh, maybe some of that inner work that Matt mentioned when we talked about poetry? We talked about the importance of the inner work that poetry does for mass audiences. And so I'm, I'm really eager to, uh, to bring up uh, two leaders from the Nebraska Writers Collective. Uh, Matt and Zadika, if you'd like to join me on stage, we're gonna have a, a short discussion and then they're going to entertain you. That's the mic, so give us some grace. We have one here thing. Okay. I should note that we have the past, the present, and the future of the Nebraska Writers Collective here tonight. Uh, Matt, who of course is the Nebraska State Poet, um, he recently announced he's stepping down as executive director of the collective. And Zadika is the new co chair, or executive director. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, and of course, we see you, Gina, who's over here at table four, who's the other part of that co. Thanks for both being here. Appreciate it. Uh, of course, we'll have a short discussion, and then I will get out of the way, I promise. Matt, um, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here uh, when I say that poetry is fundamentally democratic. Poems are expressions of an individual voice, uh, but they're, of course, put out in the world for others, like any piece of writing. Um, so it has to do a lot of work. It seems like you can't help but mediate between that inner consciousness um, of the reader and then have to focus on that outer world where we're all connected. So that brings us to that outer world today, which is, as we might say, that outer world feels pretty chaotic. There's a lot going on, and that's probably putting it mildly. Uh, would you share a few thoughts on that? Would you share a few thoughts on what it's like in these days to work in a medium like poetry? Especially in the face of a mid, in the face of a mid, a mass culture that doesn't necessarily always find space for reflection. Let me take a crack at that. Well, I mean, poetry is you know, when I, when we work with kids and ask, you know, what is poetry? What does poetry have that you know a novel doesn't have? And they'll say, you know, emotion, feeling metaphor, simile, and all of that uh, is, is absolutely correct. I think, I think a lot of that's the heart of what poetry is. It is emotion translated into language and using metaphor and simile, which are taking unlike things and seeing that little space where they intersect and there's just you know an atomic bomb's worth of energy in that place where unlike things meet. Um, so it is finding, uh, in whatever way we can, creatively across differences, uh, both politically, uh, matter, uh, color, anything, um, where different things intersect is absolutely necessary for poetry. And in these times, uh, I, I would say, in my own writing, of course, work through it, but the better example are with the, the students that I work with and we all work with, with the, the Writers Collective. Um, we have, we work with uh, high school and middle school students and they go up on, a, uh, you know, they're writing poems in the fall and working on them, editing them, choreographing them to deliver. And then in the spring, we get to see a festival where these students come and we find out what's important to them. 
we find out what's important to them to be writing about and editing for months, and then they get on stage and just absolutely blow us away. I know so much about the world, not because of my own writing, but because of the other poets' writing, especially these young uh, folks, these young poets. And poetry has been part of human culture as long as there's human culture. The same with dance and visual art. The, what the arts give us are these things that are essential to, to humanity and to what makes us who we are um, and helps us express it and helps us process it. And so, of course, we diminish it and nobody reads poetry. But, uh, <laughs> but then when we really need something, we find ourselves turning to poetry, turning to writing, turning uh, to these things. And it's just so important in, in times like these, even more so. Um, I am an extrovert, you will probably have guessed that, um, and I thrive on human connection. Like, so for me, what poetry is, is two things. First of all, it's a chance to tell a really great story. People try to categorize poems into certain things, but poetry can encompass anything. It can be your science fiction, it can be a conduit, it can be a protest song. It can be musical, it can be so many different things. And when you do it right, and you're speaking it out loud in a room full of people, for a quick second, everything else about everyone in the room melts away. We find that thing, that center, that draws everybody to the same place at the same time. And that's what we got me through, and I think what gets our students through as well. It's finding those moments of connection. It's finding the other weird little people just like me who are hanging on every special, beautiful, strung together little word because they matter and it gives us a chance to become one in that space. I'll take the mic and I'll hand it right back to you. <laughs> what are some of the things uh, that you hope your individual listeners, individual listeners, come away with, especially? Uh, with work such as yours that really is centered uh, in, the, in the here and the now. Most recently, I've been really focusing on the, on the five senses. Like, I think it's incredibly important to bring something down to a root where you can build things. For instance, if you bring up human, that means very specific things across many different genres. If I say Laurie season salt, that means a very specific thing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I deal in the senses and what it allows. So what I want to share about my work is I really just want to bring that connection with people. The earliest thing I learned about poetry was that politics, whatever that politics may be, is incredibly personal. So sometimes the strongest statement I can make is telling you the best story I have inside of me. It's making you understand something that's central to me. And from there, all the shifts that are made, because in that moment, there's no division between us. It's just us wrapped around in this one particular story. I think with, with writing a poem, you hope it will resonate with an audience. You hope they may not understand every word, but they'll get the feeling you had when you were writing that poem, um, which is difficult, especially in matters of, of politics. I, I think back to a, you know, 20 years ago um, when the United States uh, started bombing Iraq as a response to September 11th. Um, my wife is a poet and she was just enraged and horrified uh, by what our country was doing. And so she tried to write poems about it and couldn't. Um, she tried so hard, she kept trying, kept trying, could not write the poem because all it ended up being was just, you know, spit on a page. Um, it's not something anyone's gonna really listen to or learn from, and that's necessary to her. You have to write something that whether someone agrees with you or not, you hope there's at least a chance they will listen to you through the whole poem. Um, and finally, after more than six months of wrestling and trying to write the poem about what she was feeling, she was in Albuquerque and saw a wedding dress hanging in the window of a thrift store. That was her way into the poem. 
It was that image, not the politics. It winds around through the politics in and out, but it's finding the way to make a conversation that other people will listen to and will feel, will give you the, give you the grace to try to sit through it all, hopefully. Doesn't always work. I've done some political poems that I think are brilliant that <laughs> teed off a few people. But um, you at least try uh, to bring everyone in. I want to thank uh, Zanika and Matt for being here. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to hearing what you have to say. So I am going to go so you all can perform. You guys are the pros. So the amateur is going to get off the stage. What about who's the poet? Sure, you bet. Let's hear it for our poets. All right. Well, I'm going to read some poems for you. Um, I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote several years ago. Um, when there was a protest uh, that was gonna happen in Omaha on Dodge Street. There used to be a Mexican consulate there. And there were a lot of people who were protesting against uh, immigration policies there. And I was annoyed. Um, and so basically they were there to flip off the immigrants and I was gonna drive down to flip off them. Um, <laughs> And these things don't always go as you plan. So, for either of us. So this is a poem called Where You Point the Finger, Reflections on the Protest Against Immigrants. You drive by for the same reason you go to a zoo or turn on TV to gawk at the baboons, to chuckle at the yahoos, not expecting on a sunny afternoon in Omaha Nazi flags and salutes. This is Dodge Street, Main Street. This is your hometown, great school, high school, first kiss, land where your father died, heartland home, and the hecklers you came to heckle? Yes, they're here as promised, but you don't see them or whatever might be written on their little signs. You don't even roll down your window to give them the finger as planned. The window stays up. You stare through it at the two guys nobody's standing within 10 feet of. Two guys waving swastikas on flagpoles as if it were their football team. You just keep driving. Your own show of protest against protest suddenly feeling sharper. Your own hate melting into nothing you ever want to see written out on your own hand. Because when you call down hatred, that's one thing that will always respond and never the way you plan. It's about, you know, it's about rhetoric. It's about how we talk to each other, which is hard in frustrating times. Um, we're not always going to get it right. Um, but this this is a poem that's really about rhetoric. It's uh, I, a lot of a lot of people I know. I I brought it out after uh, the January sixth uh, attack on the Capitol, and a lot of people thought I had just written it, and it was four years old. Um, it's not that I could see the future, it's that when, the, when you can see the political rhetoric changing, you know what's gonna happen, um, or most likely to happen. So this is a poem called The Start. It probably started in a whisper, a murmur, a low tone hardly caught by the papers, a sticker, a poster, a brick wall with slogans and fresh black paint because it probably started with a shove, some bluster, a gunshot, crushed fingers. It probably started with a speech that caught the right ears on an otherwise happy day. Yellow flowers in a wooden stand on the sidewalk, red apples, radio, 
trying hard to smooth out the mood. Kid hurrying past, thinking, God, is that man on the corner shouting about me? Pulls his hat low. It probably started with another man drunk on swagger. It probably started with a small crowd coaxing exciting lies. It probably started with a neighborhood's head bowed as the drone grows each day, though they'll claim it came in a quick, monstrous surprise. And with, with talking about politics or um, trying to engage, uh, uh, you know, that poem that my wife wrote, uh, it's where she finally found the way to come into a more personal space. Um, this is a poem that's, you know, it's, it's fairly political, but I, my experience shows that it's at least been listenable because it's not railing on a policy. It is just talking about my own reactions or uh, my own emotions in something. So this poem is called The Thing That Happened. Oh, we had an intruder alert, said my fourth grade daughter when I asked how school was. She said this after the usual shoulder shrug and mumble, my kindergarten daughter sang it, yeah, we did. And I keep the car moving forward even though it feels like a bird just thwapped against a window in my chest, and this car should stop now. Over the intercom, the same silver strainers in the ceiling as the school I went to a long time ago, a voice will say, Mr. Snow, please come to the office. And what is expected is that the teacher will walk sharply to the door and lock it, that every student in the room will hide will be unseeable from the block of glass targeted above the doorknob. My fourth grader said everyone tried to fit in the prairie schooner the teacher and her husband built between the two bookcases. But there wasn't room, so she tried to squeeze herself alone behind the filing cabinet. They tell me this as no big deal. They tell me this like it's line up, single file, quiet down, hands to yourself, march outside. They can't say it like I do now. They don't think about it like it's a heartbreak poem. I have no inclination to want to ask the NRA to stop talking over yet another moment of silence. No inclination to recall the name of that school secretary in Atlanta, the one who talked an AK-47 and a gym bag full of bullets onto the floor. No inclination to think of grade school teachers laying their bodies over students, arms out, lungs pulling in so hard they could make their backs as wide as wings. It's my kindergartner. It's my fourth grader. It's another thing that happened today. But it's, it's not all about confusion and anger and loss. Um, it's a kind of a potentially beautiful time as long as we don't screw it up like we keep screwing up things. Uh, and we're all here in a room together for the first time in a few years for, for this event. Um, and this poem is just about that. Uh, this is called As We Enter the Afterword. And this was written outside Sainert's Bakery in McCook, Nebraska. <laughs> Apple planter sandwich, man. And all day, all night. All right. <laughs> Last night I listened to music in a packed cafe. Last week, I rode an airplane. I watched a movie the week before. Indoors, in not my doors, meaning blue seats, cup holders, other people nearby. And it feels weird. Not long ago, I 
barely bumped into a woman in the grocery store, and I couldn't stop apologizing, smarting with the kind of shame that stings all the way down to one's ancestors. Humanity feels new to me. Going to eat in a Chili's is irredeemably exciting. <laughs> after all this time, after last month, last year, last low death toll report that we didn't know was low yet until we saw what was possible when a hospital runs out of gloves, masks, beds, hallways, oxygen. We have looked out for one another by not doing these things. We have grown awkward. Our social skills sat scrawny from lack of blood flow. And now we gather, we pretend this is just music, again, just buttered popcorn and lights, just a Southwestern-themed cheeseburger <laughs> that we take up. I'm really glad you get the chili. <laughs> Not everybody does. People are like, what's that about? I love chili. <laughs> um, that we take on our tongues and find it transfigured into so much beyond what our minds can hold. Thank you. Keep laughing. Thank you. Keep laughing. Hey, y'all. All right. So lately, I've been starting things with something that's a bit of a benediction. So I hope y'all will ride with me through this particular process. I like to start with first. In here. Exhale. There is but one way for it. That inhale, that exhale is perfect. Exactly like this. And where you are on the map, in your life, in your feelings, return to yourself. Inhale. Exhale. Just like that. Perfection. There ain't but one story to tell, and you tell it your way. It's necessary, it's perfect, exactly as it is. Speak life, build connection. Don't allow a third person narration of you. When your voice is the single best thing the world could receive, tell me a story. Tell me your story. I'll tell you mine. Ain't but one way to shine. You stand there, perfect, full of power, exactly as you are, expand with breath, and knowing eyes upon you or not, your existence changes things, shifts the world. This magic that people talk about, baby, that's you. Just like this. Perfection. falling in the woods. 
until they are not. Until we are told again and again living our own flawed and normal life is reason enough for execution. Until our murderers are given reason after reason why killing us is an act of valor. Until George Floyd. Until Breonna Taylor. The first notes of their funeral marches were 120 decibel sirens. I do not know the exact decibel level of a heartbeat. Not when it thunders as a person thinks I may very well die today. Not the faint remaining threat to make our doubt irrational. These deaths at this time in our history drove the masses, fueled by horror and silent emotion, and we're starting to see it. The debates and demands, the resistance, bits of coordinated chaos to bring about change. News and commentary added trouble to the baseline of the body clamoring for recognition of their humanity. It was messy and it was loud and then The attempts to gag. It is not possible to measure the volume of systemic escalation of violence against citizens, but the war tools used to enact that violence, they are raucous. Low-flying helicopters, 78 decibels. Gunshots, 140 decibels. Flashbang grenades, 160 decibels. Long-range acoustic devices to disperse crowds, 162 decibels, and I heard all of these sounds in the not-so-far-off distance or in the news. In my neighborhood, we don't lend our voices to chants or slogans. Yard and window signs speak our allegiances. The yard signs have disappeared twice. Now we watch for attempts to extinguish even these small statements because surviving this time is necessarily so I make better decisions in silence. Ask myself important questions like, where is the place where I can both wage war against all the things that would steal the last breath of everyone I hold dear and still stay here where I can love and nurture them? Is that selfish? What is the best method to rub each other's spine straight when the weight of this never-ending oppression gets too heavy? Is it even possible? How do we raise a child with the strength and intellect to navigate all we leave behind? Not all of it will be good. Some of it will be so much worse. I need you to know I'm not a pessimist. I just have ears. Mm -hmm. I am on the cusp of sensory overload. It is an ungodly hour. This house hums around 30 decibels with the sleeping sounds of my family and me. Not crying. Anyone listening would say there is not a noise between these walls. There is no sound in the human brains to communicate this, to voice these midnight vigils over eviscerated parts of myself. What could soundtrack the work necessary to gather myself together by moment? How loud did it need to be? This is a fight every day for sanity, for small moments of joy, for recharging enough so the next detonation doesn't shred me to the bone. All this death and all these death dealers haunt me. People are out here having normal, everyday 60 decibels conversations about my game. They can make up a point and return to their even ready grief. This house. Chaos outside our door never stops, never slows, never shifts from our focus, and all we have to get through it is talk. Pulling together prayers like protest dances. The most important ones I pour into my family, telling my partner to be safe when he leaves home at night, telling my child she is brilliant and important. Telling myself we might maybe just survive this. All at a whisper of 30 decibels.
Get real. Let me know. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap this up with my favorite thing to read because that was a bit heavy. So let's talk about pie. How about that? <laughs> if you met me, you've heard this story. So <laughs> some families can spin loving tales about where they come from. Those folks have parables about their history. Yeah, my family don't do that. <laughs> we make each other. <laughs> the best story that my family knows how to tell you will fill your belly with memories. And I got these things this year, right? It's a rolling pin and a cast iron skillet from my grand, and a recipe that's a whole lot more memory than many. See, first you bring water to a boil. Then put in some butter, because Maddie Pratt accepted no substitutes the few times she actually decided to. <laughs> then some lemon and orange juice from a late night experiment of mine. Brown sugar, a touch of oil to complement the bite and sit juices. And then the perfect combination of cinnamon and nutmeg. That'll remind you of my mom. Her rum is slightly red complexion in the summertime. And it should taste earthy and not grainy and not too sweet. Then you stir so it doesn't stick to the bottom of the pan when that liquid clings to the back of your spoon at peaches. Now fresh ones. See, look, you can't use cans. Those things cook down to mush, but the fresh ones, mm. That lets you know you're really eating something, right? <laughs> Remind us of the days beyond commodity cans when fresh fruit was more than just a luxury. You let it all cook low and slow till the liquid starts to taste like the drink you just had. Look here. You go out to taste it and then modify it. Taste again, because in this family, we learn things by doing. And we will not serve food that has not crossed our own lips first and for no other reason than your aunties are me. <laughs> <laughs> and they will suck your teeth and push back their tickets. You have the audacity to get this wrong. <laughs> now, when it's perfect, you put it in the with crust and bacon. And this is a very important. You gotta take that crust and push it down to the bottom. Cause y'all know, don't nobody want to cobble without those extra little bits of sauce and crust. Cover the top with crust again, bake it and wait for the perfect dust. That's somewhere between the shade of my palm and the back of my hand. When it cools, mm. you have the perfect way to close out a family dinner. And the hint of buttery citrus clinging to the walls of your kitchen if you do it right. You know the smell better than the directions. Because this is how we remember. It's our potato salad, our jerk chicken, our seasoned vegetables. It's this, this each cup. This is my family's history on a warm plate, and it's heavy with memory and spice. So what I need you to do. Take a spoonful, savor every bit of it. Let it roll around on your tongue until you know exactly what it tastes like when somebody loves you. Take this recipe and make it your own. Maybe accident your way into a couple of improvements. And if ever anybody anywhere has the nerve to ask you who you are or who your people are, let me know. Sometimes they get into a little good trouble, Mr. Lewis once said. They also emblemize Civic Nebraska's core values of community, innovation, learning, power, and optimism. Those are our big five. 
If you're lucky enough to know any of tonight's honorees, you know that to them, those kinds of words aren't just words, right? They're a way of life. So let's get started, shall we? We have a contingent from the panel who has arrived, and we're so happy to have you here tonight. So Gilbert and Marcia, come on up and present our first award. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here to celebrate with Valeria and all the other awards. Our, our name is Silvio Rodriguez, and my name is Maricia Guzman. And it's our pleasure to tell you about our first award winner tonight. Each year, Civic Nebraska honors a community builder who connects others, creates collaborations, and builds coalitions towards a shared community goal. This Nebraska embodies Civic Nebraska's belief that we are all better when we are all better, and that our communities are strongest when we all take ownership of them. Valeria Rodriguez fits this description perfectly. She puts collaboration at the heart of everything she does in her community. In 2017, Valeria, along with other community members, like Mauricia, recognized that Scott's love and daring and the Panhandle had several needs. They included, better promotion of diversity in the community, access to higher education for all students, regardless of their status, opportunities for community members to learn about their power to create change, and understanding of how more of us can be civically engaged. So Valeria did what she does best, and she put us all to work. <laughs> <laughs> we co-founded Empowering Families, a nonprofit that builds a stronger and more welcoming community. It does this through education, civic participation, and individual empowerment. She continues as executive director while also working as a full-time uh, at, at Immigrant Legal Center, as well as um, keeping up with her family and her community. Under Valeria's leadership, Empowering Families has created DACA and naturalization clinics, hosted, Mexican con hosted the Mexican consulate several times, um, Empowering Families has, as of this Saturday, registered 150 voters, helped residents um, complete the census, and Empowering Families hosts the annual Multicultural Youth Leadership Conference, which serves over 200 students in the Panhandle as well as the community. In her spare time, Valeria continues to build connections within the community and offer any advice or help that she can offer. If you ever go on a road trip with her, she gets several calls and texts. <laughs> Valeria believes the more inclusive, welcoming, and bonded the community is, the stronger it can be. In other words, we all do better when we all do better. We are proud to nominate Valeria for Civic Nebraska's 2020 Community Builder Award, and we are even prouder to present it to her tonight. Thank you, Valeria, for all that you do. Forges collaborations 
and strengthens the common good. They know that building the right relationships is more important than being right. Aaron Feichtinger checks every single one of these boxes, and most boxes twice. <laughs> this year, Aaron organized, educated, and activated hundreds of Nebraskans to fight for emergency rental assistance and for other matters of fundamental housing fairness. She had a huge impact on the Nebraska legislature, both as a constituent and as an innovative organizer. Erin is a tireless and creative advocate for housing justice, who rallies people across the state and across the political spectrum to get involved in housing advocacy. In her role as a moderator for the 92-member Housing Advocacy Collaborative, Erin has shared call to action, given expert guidance on housing affordability issues, and has fortified a growing network of advocates who are determined to make change. And she hates that I'm saying all of this about her. Erin <laughs> does much of this in her free time. In fact, she recently began a new job with the Women's Fund of Omaha, but she's continuing to coordinate the Housing Advocacy Collaborative, or the HAC, as we like to call it, and thank goodness for that. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> we would be lost without you. Housing is essential for everyone, but it's not always a popular topic in our halls of power. Advocates often meet resistance from elected officials and entrenched interests. Erin has been a key driver in finding compromise to make sure that Nebraskans have access to safe and affordable housing. She works with legislators to find creative solutions when there is resistance and pushback. During these times, Erin often resists the very human temptation to win every argument. Instead of always needing to be right, she builds the right relationships. Sometimes our annual process of choosing winners for our Strengthening Democracy Awards can be quite the debate. Um, in this case, there was no question. It was, it was all for Erin. Erin Feitzinger is Nebraska's 2022 Civic Catalyst. <laughs> share a little bit about Civic Nebraska's Champion of Learning for 2022. The Champion of Learning builds a more informed and engaged democracy and advances learning as an act of civic engagement. This Nebraskan exemplifies the notion that gaining of new knowledge, both formal and informal, inside and outside established systems is the foundation of every pillar of our democratic life. For those of you who have met Ebony McKeever and worked with Ebony, you know this award was basically developed and built just for her. Yep. <laughs> she serves, and I use the word serves very intentionally as the Nebraska Department of Education's social studies specialist. She took the role in 2019, about the same time the state was rolling out new graduation requirements in the field that she was responsible for. This time of change requires us to listen to one another because listening leads to learning. And Ebony has traveled the state first to listen and then to share the importance of strong social studies education for all Nebraska students. She has regular conversations about, well, having conversations. She helps educators in Nebraska reflect, prepare, and have difficult conversations about our shared history. Often, this means centering those who have been historically marginalized. This work is difficult, it's complex, and it has the potential to be disputed and argued over. And that's why I believe that Ebony, who by the way is a self-proclaimed civics nerd, <laughs> is the perfect person at this time in our history to carry out this work. And I'm really grateful for Civic Nebraska um, that they wholeheartedly agree. 
Ebony embodies our state's concerted, concerted effort that social studies should include all people across their race, their color, their religion, their orientation, and their background. Yes, she's in the business of civic learning, but for Ebony, it's about way more than that. She sees a day when all students can realize their power that comes with being truly engaged in their communities. And so I'm honored to present the 2022 Champion of Learning Award to Ebony McKeever. Yeah!
gosh, I can't believe I even get to stand on the stage with these award recipients. <laughs> um, hi, friends. Indeed, the future is bright. Uh, my name is Denise Powell, and I'm presenting our final award this evening. Woo! Woo! A voting rights guardian is a change leader who connects others to the power of voting. They spread faith in our elections. They stand up and they speak out. They actively defend everyone's right to cast a ballot with as few barriers as possible. That is Jennifer Yegby Hernandez for sure. I met Jennifer five years ago when she was running for the clerk of the district court in Omaha, Douglas County. She tackled her campaign with passion and optimism, and she worked hard to canvas a massive district that included 200,000 potential voters. Even while this working mom spent hours pounding the pavement for her own campaign, she found time to support other women running for office. Every time I saw Jennifer, she had her messenger bag filled with her campaign lit, plus literature for like two or three other candidates, if not more. That tells you everything you need to know about Jennifer. Not only did she take the courageous step to run for office, uh, a seat in which she believed she could make a difference, she carried several other women's campaigns on her shoulders. Jennifer's heart for service didn't end with her campaign. In 2020, with COVID on everyone's mind, she recognized the need to help people get their vote by mail ballots turned in properly and on time. So she created Ballot Buddy, a volunteer initiative to help stuck at home voters get their signed and sealed ballots to the election commission. Ballot Buddies is still going strong in Douglas County. Jennifer is an unpaid but passionate leader. She recruits and vets volunteers and promotes the importance of voting. She also provides nonpartisan education about the candidates, election deadlines, and helps others make a plan to vote. Pandemic or no pandemic, making voting accessible is, uh, to everyone is of utmost importance. Jennifer spends much of her free time leading initiatives to create better access to resources that many of us take for granted. She is a wonderful example of how one person's ideas and hard work can make the world a more equitable place. Jennifer, I'm proud to say that you are Nebraska's Voting Rights Guardian for 2022. Nebraska 
has so nailed this in terms of understanding that the work is both at the level of policy and structure and laws, but also at the level of culture um, and attitudes. And that's what de Tocqueville talked about when he talked about American democracy and the strength of it, which is that it's really about the habits of the heart and the, way, the ways in which people embody that. So thank you, Adam, for your vision and leadership in, in setting up this extraordinary organization. Thank you to all the amazing staff. And thank you to all the people throughout the state that are doing the work every single day. Um, you'll notice on your table that there is a riser, um, and on that, it, it, says, it says we're claiming we on that. And on that card, as well as on the bottom of your programs, um, there's a web address as well as a QR code that uh, takes you, yes, to our donate link. Um, we, can't go through, we can't go through the evening without a little bit. Um, and I say this because you know, we can't do the work that we do without the support of everyone. Um, just as uh, by way of example, $50 provides materials and resources for a voting rights advocacy training. And um, though that is really so that we can continue to build an extraordinary network of volunteers across the state. These volunteers are essential for election observation, for outreach, canvassing, and relationship building so we can keep our elections modern and accessible. Um, $100 allows us to hold a civic health community conversation in a town, city, or neighborhood in Nebraska. Uh, our civic health team knows that communities are stronger when residents own them and their issues together, and we support them in doing that. $250 provides an entire capital experience day, um, just like the one that Brooklyn um, went to a few years ago that gave birth to her idea to, uh, for new legislation. We host students across Nebraska at the state capitol dozens of times each year um, for a deep dive into our government. And you can help us inspire a, a new generation of young civic leaders uh, in service of their fellow Nebraskans. So again, um, as we know, every little, you know, the ripple effect, every little bit counts, no donation is too small. Um, so thank you again for being with us this evening. Thank you all for being uh, committed supporters of democracy in the civic Nebraska. Congratulations again to our winners and have a great